the title of this talk was misleading in, your, uh, in our uh, lanyards. They say uh, how you were involved as a marketer. This has nothing to do with you, of course. Uh, some of you are happy evolving as you evolve. Some of you don't want to evolve in marketing, like some designers and developers in the house. This, of course, this is the story of how I evolved in marketing, how Pipedrive has evolved in marketing. Uh, and on a practical level, it's a story of growing a company from zero to 30,000 paying customers. So hopefully, there's something uh, for everybody here to learn. Who am I? I am a, a T-shaped marketer. Do you know this expression? Yeah, so it's, uh, I know a bit of, uh, of a broad uh, range of subjects, but I'm specialized in acquisition marketing, mostly content marketing. Uh, I, for the first 10 years of my marketing career, I was working on fast-moving consumer goods and, and media. Uh, and then about 10 years ago, I switched to technology. I worked uh, at Skype marketing here in Tallinn, and then uh, four years in London. And then about six years ago, I, I started working with startups. And I've been launching startups, uh, advising startups, investing in startups, failing at startups since then. A couple of the logos uh, on this slide uh, don't make any sense to you because the companies don't exist anymore, and it's all my fault. <laughs> I'm currently head of marketing at uh, Pipetribe, uh, running a team of 20 marketers uh, here in Tallinn and in, in New York. Uh, and finally, I'm, a, I'm a also co-founder of, of Tallinn Comedy Festival. And you think that comedy and marketing don't really have anything uh, to do with each other, but as we will see at 6.30 today, they will. Or they do. Who, have, who here has heard of Pipedrive before? Ah, oh, we've done some things right. Good. Um, so Pipedrive, uh, Pipedrive helps salespeople who usually struggle with focus. Sales teams, salespeople can spend their time with, uh, in their email inbox, they can spend time in, in talking to customers who buy, talking to customers who, who don't buy no matter what they do. So it's difficult for them to keep focus. And Pipedrive helps to uh, keep focus on the things, on the activities which drive deals to close, which is especially useful if you manage something which we call complex sales, if you have to talk to customers several times uh, to close a deal over many months. And we've tried to keep the tool simple. If you want to use Pipedrive, there's a promo code, the Leadcamp, get two months free. Uh, there's a thing called social proof, which I think everybody, has, everybody here knows. This is my social proof slide. Pipedrive is used by quite well-known companies in the world. But most of the customers of Pipedrive are a bit like play bases which is a company in Singapore. I don't know what they do. Most of the companies are, I mean, Pipedrive customer base are just small companies somewhere in the world selling something which is slightly complex to sell. And this is the outline of this talk today. So Pipedrive has gone through four very different stages of marketing. First one is hand-to-hand -hand combat. Second is scalable weapons, where you don't just take one a customer down, but you, you take many, like a machine gun or a, something like that. Uh, then the, the, there was a stage we started about a year, year and a half ago, which was about mobilization, getting more people uh, to man these machine guns. And final stage of uh, weapons of mass distribution, which is a term I didn't coin, but I really like. And I have to apologize. I'm using a war metaphor for this kind of backbone of this talk. And I don't mean that customers are enemy who have to be shot down. In fact, I'd like to believe the opposite is true uh, on a good day. So, so let's plow in. Pipedrive started, I'm gonna, let's, take, let's pretend this is a time machine, let's go back to, to February of 2011, when we had launched the product publicly and customers started to come in. And the customers we had, the first 20 or 30 customers, were really excited to use the product. The problem was the growth from that point onwards was very slow. So having a product which customers liked, even loved, wasn't enough. The growth was very, very small. So it was time to then start 
uh, the, the stage one, so hand-to-hand -hand combat, how to get customers one by one to use the product. Uh, it was a lot of going to events and networking and going through people's, like my own and, and founders of Rolodexes, trying to convince customers to sign up and use the product one by one. It was also about uh, going outside of Estonia, uh, because uh, the hypothesis was that if you have happy customers in Estonia and maybe Finland, this is not enough to get the product growing, uh, growing globally. So we went to networking events in Europe. Uh, the founding team spent the uh, first weeks in the summer and then later four months uh, in San Francisco as part of the AngelPad incubator. Um, got very good connections and, and kind of opportunities to, to pitch further there. So this hand-to-hand -hand combat lasted for maybe six to eight months. And as a result, uh, things started to change. So the graph I was looking, uh, showing uh, earlier, I scaled down the numbers on the, on the left uh, bottom corner. Something clicked. And then Piperev uh, started growing when we, got, when we got the good product into the hands of the right kind of customers in, in the right geography, which for Piperev's case was, uh, was Silicon Valley was, the, was a great place to be. Uh, for other types of businesses, kind of a central hub, maybe somewhere else. In Pipedrive's case, uh, being in Silicon Valley was a good choice. So, first step, hand-to-hand -hand combat. The bare uh, hygiene factor is having a good product, and then you have to use hand-to-hand -hand combat to get it in the right hands of customers, and then you can, you can actually start uh, growing uh, on a scalable way. Pipedrive had five founders. And even with five founders, there's a limit to how many customers you can conquer with hand-to-hand -hand combat. So obviously, we started to look for scalable channels. We tried them all. I think literally all channels. Uh, and we learned a lot. If I could turn back clock and go into early 2011, I would do, 2012, I would do many things differently. I would focus on only a couple types of channels. Um, and how I stum stumbled upon these channels of this kind of thinking, in hindsight, uh, was uh, strange because it's so blindingly obvious if I'm going to tell this to you. I'm probably the last person in this room who figured out what the startup should focus on in the early days. Do you know Jim Collins? He's an author who's written Good to Great. He has a thing called the Hedgehog Strategy. And Hedgehog Strategy is when, uh, when you do only one thing really well. Well, I'm proposing a two Hedgehog Strategy, which is you have to do two things really well. Uh, and, and these two things, I think, for most early stage companies is, first, you have to get people to recommend you. And second, you have to be findable. Make sense? We're going to go into, into them uh, in a bit more detail, too. So Hedgehog 1, how to get more referrals. Like I mentioned, having a good product is a prerequisite for that. And then you have to have some incentives and some triggers that motivate and incentivize and remind people to, to recommend you. Uh, I did a survey. I actually surveyed customers who had recommended Pipedrive and asked, why the hell did you do that? Uh, and I, I, I thought that maybe the, the three months we gave away was an, were an incentive. It turns out that the three months wasn't even noticed by the customers. Customers have their own reasons why they want to recommend uh, software products. Mostly they want to help a friend or a coworker, but also they just want to give away the product that they love, uh, which I think is good news as a marketer. Uh, so um, there's a trick to not overdo, I think, the incentive bit. If you, if you make it in my experience at least, if you make it too much about the incentive of why somebody should like, get a t-shirt or get a coupon or get something off, then it's, uh, you lose some of the goodwill from this process uh, and then just it gets, like a, it gets to be a commercial transaction, which it is not. So Pipe Drive's Telefriend page, which is not perfect uh, and which we're going to change next month, uh, doesn't really tell you too much about the incentive, but it really focuses on, hey, this is a good product, you should give it away. Uh, to your friend. 
Second hedgehog, uh, in hindsight, again, was being findable. Now, this is, uh, do you recognize the fish? Nemo. Uh, Nemo is a project we, we codenamed, codenamed uh, uh, we gave a code name to this project, which is Nemo. And Nemo is, is looking at being findable in a, in a holistic way. And, and this topic has, come, uh, has been discussed in this conference already before uh, on, on some levels. But this was, like if you run a CRM product, you want to be ranked for keywords like best CRM, right? If you want to be findable. Uh, let's do a bit of audience interaction. Who think that the company like Pipedrive should start from the left side, from the organic search? Two, three very, not very certain people. Who think that, uh, that Pipedrive should have started from the right-hand side of paid search? Who thinks that I should stop asking stupid questions and give you the, what I think? <laughs> one person, all right. So there is one person. Um, of course, it, it's, it is, uh, and again, this is probably something which most of, uh, most of the people in this room have already figured out, but I hadn't figured it out when we started marketing uh, kind of pipe drive uh, in, in search channels. Or I had figured out parts of it, but not the full picture. Is You have to be present throughout this page, right? It doesn't matter if it's paid or free. Uh, and each one of these uh, listings on the left has a different way of getting there. So best CRM is a keyword where it might take, take us another two or three years to start ranking organically. So there's no way our own landing page or home page would appear on the left, even if, if we have been in a business for, uh, for five or six years. Uh, but there are sites on the left-hand side where you can either negotiate your way in or buy your way in or just pitch and haggle and hand-to-hand and -hand combat your way in. So that's what we did. Last year, uh, we officially did a project of, of mapping our about 15 or 16 keywords, looking through the first page of Google results, and then reached out to each of these sites individually. Uh, for instance, here, I think we started out being present on one of these sites. Now we are present on three of them. Uh, and and you, you, you end up in weird situations where, like, in our model, what we want to buy is clicks. Pipedrive doesn't want to buy leads because we have no salespeople to give these leads to call to. But for instance, this one site, Software Advice, they only sell leads. So what we then did is we bought leads from them and we made a filter which is that tight, so we've got very few leads, but we don't use the leads. We're only buying these leads in order to be visible in the, in the, in the page if you click through, if this makes sense. Um, and the one thing which we, which we kind of started doing early on from this two hedgehog strategy, without calling it a two hedgehog strategy, was content marketing, which is very, very much of part of being findable. And we have learned a couple of things about content marketing. Um, quick poll: Given the choice during the coffee break, who would? Uh, by the way, this thing on the right is called Kringle or cake. Let's call it cake. So in the, next, in the next coffee break, Kringle is a kind of local, not really cake, but cake-like thing. So in the next coffee break, who would prefer to have broccoli? One liar. Who would, <laughs> who would prefer to have a cake? Many more. We know that broccoli is good for us. We know it's healthy. We know it's, this, this is what our body needs. But we opt for cake. And the same is true for content marketing. The heavy stuff, the thing which actually makes you a better marketer, a better salesperson, a better leader, is not easy to digest. It's, it's broccoli. And yet, we kind of, we, 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 on content, we click on easy headlines, or 10 tips, and, and, and this and that. The easy promise of, hey, you, you, if you read this listicle, then you'll, uh, you'll instantly boost your conversion rate by 83% or something. So what's a marketer to do then? People need broccoli, but they want cake. Uh, we haven't fully figured it out. One of the ways we do is we lure people in with, um, with cake, and we quickly switch it, and offer them 
broccoli. In a sense that we have uh, spent quite a bit of time putting together uh, one, of, like, one email course, which is called Sales Pipeline Academy, which took uh, two months to put together the content, uh, about four rounds of editing all in all, two different marketing automation uh, programs, uh, a lot of design uh, work. And we know that if people go through that, they will probably convert. They just can't resist us anymore. Uh, so we get people in the blog with, uh, with Kringle, we get them into the targeting funnel, we try to get them to sign up to Sales Pipeline Academy, and then hopefully they will convert. One thing to point out is you can't mix them. You can't, you can't make cake out of broccoli. The worst thing to do is do something in between. So I think it's either you do one or the other, but just be mindful of the balance that you need to, kind of, you need to keep in, in the content. Uh, and then I, I think a good indicator of a content's quality is, is how people tweet about it. If people tweet the headline, they might not have even read the post. They just want to appear to have read this clever piece of content. But if people make up their own quote or opinion about the content piece, and if they tweet it, then that must mean that they're really engaged and found it really useful. So these are some, just some tweets which the Sales Pipeline Academy has gotten over the last uh, couple of months. Uh, second thing we learned about content marketing is there are only two ways of doing content marketing. The right way and the wrong way. Uh, and by the, this was a joke by the way, sorry for <laughs> humor, but the, the two ways I think are, one is, is uh, you, you optimize for virality. So you try to make something which, which people start to share and which people start to engage and share on Facebook. Uh, I tried it and realized I'm very bad at it. So the other kind of content you can do is if you do keyword research, if you know what people actually look for, uh, and if you know the keywords which are relevant for what you do, which have low competition and high search volume, if you focus your, all your efforts on that kind of content, you don't need to worry about distribution, and your content gets traffic by itself, and, uh, and, and you will profit. There's a post I've written about it, if you, anybody wants uh, to, to read more about keyword research. We don't have time. I think all, all the willingness to go into keyword research too much uh, on this stage here. This is a conversion conference as, uh, as well. Uh, so we also have done quite a bit of uh, conversion rate optimization, which, uh, which is, I have mixed feelings about it. So every time we put, up, put live a test which has 10% conversion uplift, we haven't seen 10% faster growth. So maybe it's because of the way we have done tests, maybe because, because we've implemented them wrongly, but we've done, this is only maybe, this covers maybe 15% of the testing we've done, and we haven't seen the business results after that. Why it's useful, though, is there's a process for doing this. Uh, there's like, if you listen to Pep, if you listen to speakers here, it's not just blindly changing the copy or blindly changing the, the image and expecting things to go better, but it's really about uh, asking your customers, either directly or via Qualaru, what hesitations do you have when signing up? What do you want to get out of this product? Why didn't you sign up? And getting that knowledge, getting that information has been really useful. Uh, that, that's been the useful part. Uh, for instance, we learned that uh, if we address hesitations that people have before they sign up, we impre improved conversion by 5%, which is great. And then if we remove the block, which removes hesitations, we increase conversion by 10%, uh, which I guess is, is a good lesson in I was listening to Pep yesterday, and Pep said that you shouldn't, trust, you shouldn't trust best practice, you should think about it, you should kind of develop your own hypotheses, talk to customers, not just follow best practice. And I think that advice, Pep, is best practice. So you can, <laughs> so you can safely ignore the advice to ignore best practice, and sometimes just implement best practice, is to clean up your sign-up page and push that some test live. Gets very meta, I know. But it's, I think, also super practical. 
Uh, and on one, one thing which works really well for us was uh, when we started uh, putting geo-specific, we are a global, probably the most global company of our size in the sense that we have uh, 30,000 customers in more than 130 countries. And we started putting geo-targeted elements on the homepage and other, other pages uh, as well. So if you come in from Florida, you'll see the number of users in Florida, and you'll see testimonials from Florida. If you come in from Texas, you'll see different faces. If you come in from Austria, you see different faces. This improved conversion either by 13% or 16%. And the lesson learned is uh, start documenting lessons learned early on. Because uh, I would have liked to kind of give you the, the, the confident number, but just we've uh, managed to, to lose the test results in the, in the process of growing. So all this testing and two, two hedgehog, or, or we actually tried many more hedgehog, uh, got, to, got me to view Pipedrive's marketing as a Greek temple. When I say that, I don't mean that Pipedrive's marketing is in ruins. Or when I say that, I don't mean that the marketing is run with the efficiency of the Greek people. What I mean is a temple has a solid foundation, a solid base, it has pillars, and it, these pillars hold up something valuable. Uh, so for Pipedrive's marketing, the, the foundation is really uh, developing the value proposition, uh, a good understanding of the brand, of the customer, having some processes in place for NPS, having, um, having a website which, which kind of is communicating the value proposition. There were four pillars. Uh, which really drove us significant growth out of maybe eight or ten pillars we tested. So content and SEO and paid, which together form a good piece of um, findability. Referrals, so there was uh, the untracked referrals and, and tracked referrals, huge channel for us. And then growth engineering, which, sometimes, which is something we have done on and off. Uh, and these four channels held up kind of onboarding and customer lifecycle marketing. Which was a very useful way of looking at marketing for almost three years. At the end of last year, we realized that this is not the most effective method going forward because uh, with a thing like Project Nemo, where do you put it? You have to break these barriers between the paid and content teams, for instance. And that's, a, that's been an evolution since then. And then, I think about middle of last year, when we also had raised a bit of funding, then every challenge we had started pointing at me. So I found myself to be the bottleneck almost always. So it was really the last time. And we, we had, I think we already had three, four people in marketing then, or three. So it was really time to, to scale the team and start hiring people aggressively. And uh, I'm... Uh, there's probably people who are better hiring, better at hiring than I am. Uh, certainly have my opinions there, but but yeah, it was like it was a it was a mental shift of here. Yeah, you need to now stop marketing, and stop and start hiring and people managing. So I for some so for a period of time I didn't consider myself a marketer at all. I was more in a recruiting department. And as you bring on new as you bring in new people, you realize that like, I think when we grew from four people to eight people. We didn't double the speed of doing work and doing experiments. I think we actually slowed down at times. And the problem was that if you only bring in people, and if you don't introduce systems for people not to bump into each other and not to bump into lack of vision and lack of clarity, then you, don't, you only have solved half the equation. I'm going to go back to the war analogy here. Uh, when, when Hitler started Project Barbarossa in 1941. Um, he had the deadliest army on the planet, the deadliest, most experienced army on the planet. But yet, you know, the harsh Russian winter uh, cracked, cracked him down because the, the, the German army didn't have the supply lines, the ammunition, the food, uh, and blankets to really Fight, have a decent chance of fighting the just sheer numbers of Russian army. So people without processes, and this is a quote by Brian Belfour, who was the v, 
VP of Growth at HubSpot and is now running a growth course with Andrew Chen in, in, in San Francisco. So growth really is people and then processes. And, and then I think the last six months of my evolution as a marketer have been about process design more than anything else. Um, why the Bond villain? Uh, I just, I just it's, it's kind of in my head, this kind of uh, image of a Bond movie when Bond gets to a, like after sleeping with lots of beautiful women and fighting with lots of beautiful men, he gets to a room and there's a guy about to press a button. And if this guy pressed the button, some am amount of ammunition and resources would fly into exploding some part of the world. That's kind of, that's marketing at this kind of fourth stage to me is you, you have buttons you can press and then some amount, of, some amount of people, money and other resources will flow into either conquering a market or conquering a channel or conquering something else. Uh, so, and then a couple of examples, uh, a process of having all hands meetings. Uh, it felt strange if, as the team grew to have 15 or 12 people on a call reading out their to-do lists. It just felt awkward. So we changed that meeting to be the learning hour, where everybody comes in and just shares what they have learned in the previous two weeks. Uh, and this meeting, while it's not perfect every time, has become one of my favorite meetings of, of the whole kind of meeting calendar, because it can be immensely useful. Another example is we have had um, problems sometimes when we test new channels, then we implement something for two weeks and test something and it doesn't work. So the two weeks implementation has been a waste of time. We agreed then a set of nine principles of how do we do things around here. One of them is we always test lean and never test anything which takes more than two hours to implement. Uh, and if, uh, and if, if that's an agreed principle, then you don't need to, uh, to, kind of, to police individual decisions about the uh, about, uh, new channels to test. Almost there. One but last slide. I'm a kite surfer, uh, and I've realized that if I go kite surfing, and if I get off the water and my hair is still dry, Maybe I had a pleasant session, but I didn't, I didn't learn anything. So while this pipe drive story of growing from zero to more than 30,000 paying customers, uh, I don't know how easy or difficult it felt based on this presentation, but, uh, but at times we've crashed hard, and I've crashed hard. Uh, I really got my, got my uh, hair wet properly. And always when this happens, it's very unpleasant. If you are underwater in plus 18 degrees water or plus 14 degrees water, it's very unpleasant, but you, also, you always learn something. So I just encourage you to fail. Fail a lot and em 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 embrace failure and uh, get your head wet. This is, uh, this is the last slide. There's going to be no more slides. One final thing. I'm a fan of conferences, of, of this conference, other conferences. I'm a fan of podcasts and blogs and books. But I found that if you, if you want to calculate ROI on time, then it's about one to 10 ratio of actually talking to others, talking to other people in your field, because then you can ask questions, then you can put it to context, then you can really steer the conversation in where you want to steer it. This morning I had a very good talk with Nilan Peris, who was the first speaker today, and I tried to make it a habit to, to just have a conversation with other marketers uh, on a regular basis. Uh, so happy to chat during the workshop today, especially if you bring me beer. Uh, and even later, we're happy to always get, get on the phone and just have a chat or, or catch up. Thank you.